Hey there, how's it going everybody? In this video, we'll be creating our own database tables for our application so that we can create real posts instead of relying on dummy data. And to work with these databases, Django has its own built-in ORM. Now, if you don't know what an ORM is, it stands for Object Relational Mapper, and basically it allows us to access our database in an easy to use object oriented way. And the thing that I like about it most is that you can use different databases without changing your code. So if you wanna use an SQLite database for testing and a Postgres database for production, then all you need to do is set up a different database in our settings, but all of the code to query the database will still be the same. And that's what we'll be doing in this series. We'll use an SQLite database for development and a Postgres database for production. So let's go ahead and get started so that we can see what this looks like. Now, the great thing about the Django ORM is that we can represent our database structure as classes, and you'll hear those classes be called models. And doing the database structure this way is actually very intuitive after you get the hang of it. So within our blog app, Django has already created a models.py file for us. So within the blog app directory, let's open up that models.py. So within our models.py file, we need to think about what we actually wanna to save to the database. So the main things that we're gonna have for our blog application are going to be users, and those will be the authors of our posts. And then we're gonna have the posts themselves. Now, like we saw in the previous video, Django already has a built-in authentication system and already has a user model that it's created for us. And we've already seen how to create some users with that. So we're not going to make a new user model just yet. Now in a future video, we'll see how to add custom fields to that user model uh, that aren't already there. But for now, we are simply going to just make a post model. And this will be a class that inherits from Django model class. And we can see that it's already imported these models for us. So let's go ahead and create our post class or our post model. So I'm going to delete the comment that we have here. And now let's create this post model. So I'm going to say class post, and we are going to inherit from models.model. So each class is going to be its own table in the database. And now we'll create some attributes and each attribute will be a different field in the database. So let's add the fields that we want for a post. So one field that we'll have for a post will be the title. So we can say that the title is equal to models.char field. So this is going to be a character field and we can set some arguments here uh, that will specify some restraints on these fields. So I can set a max length here equal to 100. So now we have a title that will be a field of our post table in the database. And that title field will be a character field that has a restriction of a max length of 100. Um, so now what else do we want for a post? So we also want content for the post. So we'll say content is equal to, and we'll set this equal to models dot text field. Now the text field is similar to the character field, but with our content here, uh, it's going to be, you know, possibly lines and lines and lines of text. So a text field here is just unrestricted text. Okay, and lastly for a post, we're also gonna want a date posted field so that we can keep track of when these posts were created. So I'll say date posted is equal to models dot and this will be a date time field. Okay, so for our date time field, we have a few different options here. Now we could set an argument of auto underscore now equal to true, which means that we would update the date posted to the current date time every time the post was updated. Now that's not exactly what we want. So that would be great for a last modified field or something like that, uh, but this is going to be when the post was actually created. Now we could also set an argument of auto underscore now underscore add equal to true. And that would set the date posted to the current date time only when this object is created. And that sounds exactly like what we want, but there's a caveat there. So with that auto now, now add argument, uh, you can't ever update the value of the date posted. So it will have to keep the exact date time of when the post was created. Now, maybe that's what you'll want, uh, but I like having the option of changing these dates if I want to. So instead, I'm going to use an argument uh, I'm going to use neither of those auto now arguments, and instead I'm going to use an argument of default. And we're going to import a Django utility for this default. So here at the top, I will say from Django.utils, 
import time zone. And this will be a date time that takes our time zone settings into consideration. So now for our default, we can simply say default is equal to time zone dot now. And also notice that we didn't put the parentheses after time zone dot now like this. Um, now this is a function, but we don't actually want to execute that function at that point. Uh, we just want to pass in the actual function as the default value. So be sure that you don't put parentheses there to execute that. Okay, so now moving on, we also need to have an author for each post. And this will be the user who created the post. Now our user is a separate table. So first we need to import the user model. And Django created that in the location. So up here in our imports, we'll say from Django, oops, from Django dot contrib dot auth dot models import user. So the post model and the user model are going to have a relationship since users are going to author post. Specifically, this is going to be called a one to many relationship because one user can have multiple posts, but a post can only have one author. And to do this in Django, we can simply use a foreign key. So I will come down here to our other field and say author is equal to models dot foreign key. And then the argument that we want to pass into that foreign key is the related table, and that will be user. Now we're also going to need a second argument here called on underscore delete. So on delete. And this is needed because we need to tell Django what we want to do if the user who created this post gets deleted. So if a user created a post and then the user was deleted, then do we want to delete the post or do we want to set that author to none or what do we want to do? Well, for this app, we'll just say that if a user is deleted, then we're also going to uh, delete their post as well. So the argument we're going to pass in here is on delete is equal to oops, is equal to models dot cascade. And cascade is going to be uh, all uppercase. So again, that's just telling Django that if a user is deleted, then we want to delete uh, their posts as well. But that's only a one way street. So if you delete a post, then it's not going to delete the user because you know, that would be uh, definitely a bad design. Okay, so that does it for our post model. So that is all of the information that we need. So now that we've made some changes to what our Django database is going to hold. Uh, now, if you remember in the last video, we needed to run migrations in order to update the database with any changes. So let me pull up the command line here. And now we need to rerun those migrations in order to get any changes to our database. So if you remember, uh, in order to create those migrations, we need to say Python manage.py make migrations. So let's run that. And we can see that it says that it made a migration in this location, blog migrations 0001 underscore initial dot pi. Now, I never really touched these files myself, but they are files that we can open up and look at. So within our app, if we go back to Sublime here, within my blog app, I'm going to uh, expand this migrations directory. And within this migrations directory, we can see this uh, 0001 underscore initial dot pi. So let's open this up. So this is what got created when we ran make migrations. And we can see a bunch of information in here about what it will do once we actually run the migrate command. So the make migrations command just made these files for what it will do uh, and the migrate command will actually run these. And we can see a couple of things about this migration. So we can see that it says initial is set to true. Uh, we can see that uh, the name of the model that it's creating is post. And we can see some, uh, we can see all of the fields that we created here. So that's a lot more information uh, than uh, what we put in, but it created that for us. Okay, so before we actually run the migrate command to actually create this table in our database, let me show you how you can view the actual SQL code that this will run on the database. Now this is great if you're having issues and need to see the exact SQL code or SQL code that is going to be generated whenever this is run. Uh, so to do this, let's pull back up our command line. And the things that we're going to want to remember are the blog here, which is the app name, and also the migration number, which is this 0001. That's how we can view the SQL that's going to be run. So I can take that information and say Python manage.py SQL 
migrate and now the uh, now the app name which is blog and then the migration number which is 0001 so if I run that then this actually prints out the SQL code that it's going to run. So we can see here that it does a create table of blog post and then uh, an ID field here, which we didn't specify, but it does a primary key automatically that auto increments. Uh, we have a title, which is a varchar of 100 characters. So it takes that simple class that we created and it writes out the SQL for all of the fields that will be compatible for the database that we're using, uh, which right now is SQL Lite. So this saves us a ton of time uh, and a lot of effort if we had to write that SQL ourselves. And really it made it so that we didn't even need to know SQL to work with this database. We just used that Python model class in our models.py file and it wrote this backend SQL for us. So that's why these object relational mappers are so convenient. We don't actually have to get our hands dirty with the SQL code a lot of the time. Okay, so now let's run the migrate command so that it runs the migration and these changes take effect on the actual database. So I'm going to clear my screen here and now let's run that migrate command. So I'll say python uh, manage.py migrate. So if we run that, then we can see that that worked and that we get an okay status there. Now I should also mention why migrations are so useful. So migrations are useful because it allows us to make changes to our database even after it's created and has data in that database. So if we didn't have a way to run migrations, then we would have to run some complicated SQL code to update our database structure so that it didn't mess with the current data. But with migrations, we can simply make whatever changes we need, uh, run make migrations, and then run migrate, and it will make all of those changes for us. Okay, so now that those changes have been added to the database, let's see how we can query the database using these models. Now the Django ORM lets us do this through the classes as well. So to illustrate this, I'm going to run the Django Python shell, which will allow us to work with these models interactively line by line. So we can run the shell by saying python manage.py, and that is the shell command. So if we run that, then we can see that we get what looks to be a Python prompt. And that's exactly what it is. We can run Python code in here, but we can also work with our Django objects. So for example, let's import both our post model and our user model. So let me clear the screen here first. And now to import that post model, we can say from blog, which is our app, blog.models, we want to import post. And now let's also import that user model. Now. If you don't remember where that is, that is in Django.contrib.auth.models, and we want to import user. Now, if you were following along with the last video where we created two users in the admin page, then we know that we already have two users. So let's query our users table and see if we can see those. So if we want to just get all of the users, then we can simply say user.objects.all. So if I run that, then we can see that it returns a query set result. And within that query set, we have this user for Cori MS and this user for test user. So it returned both of the users that we created in the last video. Now, if we just wanted to get the first user, then we could access it from that list, or we could use the first method that just gives you the first result. So if I was instead to say user.objects.first, then we can see that now we just get that first user. And there is also a last method to give us the last result. Now we can also filter the results by using the filter method. So if I was to say user.objects.filter, now we can filter by a field. So I can say uh, username is equal to, and I'll say username equal to Corey MS. Now that gives me a query set as a result, but the query set only has one user since the usernames are unique. Now, if that field wasn't unique, then it's possible a filter could return multiple results. So we could use the first method here as well, uh, just so we can get, grab the first result of that filter. So if I run that filter again, then I can do dot first, 
And now we can see that we just get that user instead of the query set with the one user in the query set. So now let's actually take a look at this user that is getting returned. So I'm going to run that same query again, where we grab the first user from that filter. But now I'm going to capture this in a variable. So I'm going to say user is equal to user.objects.filter with a username of Corey MS and grab the first uh, result of that filter. So if I run that, then now we have this user captured in this user variable. Now let me clear my screen here so that we have some more room. So again, we now have that user variable. And now we can actually look at the attributes of this user. So I can say user.id and see that this user has an ID of one. Um, now we can also use the PK attribute to get that ID, which stands for primary key. So if we say user.pk, then it gets the primary key, which is the same as the ID. Now we can actually perform queries using that ID as well. So we already saw user.objects.all and user.objects.first, but if we were to say, you know, user is equal to user.objects.get, then we can get by an ID. So I'll say ID is equal to one. And if I look at that user, then it's that same user that we saw had an ID of one. Okay, so now let me clear the screen again. Um, so now we have this user variable that is equal to this user. So now let's create a new post and make this user the author of this new post. So first of all, we shouldn't have any posts right now. So if I run a query on the post model and say post.objects.all and run that, then we get an empty query set. And that's how it should be because there are no posts. So now let's create some posts written by this user so that we can see what this looks like. So I can say post underscore one is equal to post. And now we can fill in the fields. So I'll say title is equal to uh, blog one. And then we'll set the content equal to, oops, I'm sorry, that content should not be in a string like that. Uh, sorry about that. I wanted the string to be the actual content. So for the content, I'll just fill in first post content with an exclamation point. And now we also need to set the author. So I'll say author, and sorry, it's going on to multiple lines there, but I'll say author is equal to, and I'll just pass in that user variable. So now let me run this and we can see that it doesn't give us an error. So that probably worked. Now also notice that I didn't specify a date for this post. Now, if we remember from our model, we have a default date of the current date time. So it should populate that with the current time if we don't provide it anything. So now let's query our post table again. So I'll hit up here a couple of times and rerun that post.objects.all. And we can see that this is still an empty query set. So there are still no posts. And the reason is because we created a post object as this post underscore one variable, but we didn't actually save it to our database. So to do that, we can say post underscore one dot save. And if we run that save, then now let's requery our post object or our post table again. So post.objects.all, if we run that, then we can see now we get a query set with one post object. And since our screen's getting a little crowded, let me clear the screen and rerun that again. Okay, so this is good that we have one post object. Now this post object isn't very descriptive. So if you remember when we printed out our users, it showed us the usernames of the user, which is nice and descriptive. So in order to get this post object to be more descriptive, we have to tell it what we want to see when we print it out. And we can do that with the Dunder STR method. So I'm gonna go back to our models and add this. So I'm gonna keep the shell open here and open our project back up. I'm gonna close out of the migrations file and go back to our models.py where we created this post model. And within our models, we wanna create a dunder str method. And dunder means double underscore. So this is gonna be def double underscore str double underscore. And we need to take self as an argument. And now we can return how we want this to be printed out. So I just want a post to be printed out by the title. So I'll just say return self dot 
title. Now, if anyone has seen my object-oriented series, then I go into more details about these double underscore methods. Uh, they're also called magic methods or special methods. Uh, so if you're interested in this stuff, then you can watch my object-oriented series where I go into this stuff in a lot more detail. Okay, so with that dunder str method in place, uh, let's open back up our command line here. Now, in order to get those changes to take effect, we're going to need to exit the shell and open it back up. So I will exit out of that. And now let's rerun that Python shell command. So Python manage.py shell. And now we need to re-import our post and user models. So to import the post model, I'll say from blog.models import post and import our user model. Remember that is in uh, django.contrib.auth.models import user. So now if we query all of our post objects again, so I'm just going to grab the same query that we did before. So post.objects.all, if we query that again, then now we can see that we get a query set and the object now says a post of blog one. So now it's using that blog title in order to uh, print that out. Okay, so now let me clear the screen here. So now let's add one more post that is similar to the one that we just created. Now remember, I exited the shell and opened it back up. So I lost our user variable that we were working with. So let's create that again. So I will just say user is equal to user dot objects dot filter. And we wanted to grab the user with the username equal to uh, Corey MS, you can use whatever user you created. And then we'll just grab the first user uh, that matched that filter. So now that user we can see is user Corey MS. And now let's add one more post that is similar to our first with this user as the author. So I'll say post underscore two is equal to uh, post. And then we'll pass in a title equal to blog two. And we will pass in uh, well, and I put those strings there again, we can pass in the content equal to a string of second post content. And let me make the screen a little smaller here so that uh, this new line gets pushed a little early here. Um, okay, so now last time we created a post, we for our uh, last item, we said author, whoops, and it looks like when I resized, it messed up our text a little bit. So let me just run that early and get an error and then uh, rerun this. So second post content. So now uh, the last time we created an, uh, a post object, we said author is equal to user. But instead of setting that author equal to our user, uh, we can also use the ID as well. So we can say author underscore ID is equal to user dot ID. So now if I run that, then we could see now we didn't get any errors there. So that probably worked. Now, remember, if we actually want to save that to the database, then we have to run the save method. So you don't want to forget that. So we can say post do dot save and run that. And now let's query all of our posts again. So we can say post dot objects dot all. And now we can see that we have two blog posts. So again, my screen's getting a little crowded. So let me uh, clear that out and rerun that. So now let me grab that first post and give that a look. So I'm going to save it into a variable. So I'll say post is equal to post dot objects. And I'll just grab the first one. So I'll say dot first. And now we should be able to access all of the fields uh, added to our model. So if I say post dot content, then we can see the content of that post. And like I said, our date posted should have been added automatically, even though we didn't actually set it whenever we created that post object. So let's test that to make sure that that is true. So I'll say post dot date underscore uh, posted, I think is the field that we gave. And we can see that that is a date time object. And this is the date time that this was posted. And lastly, if we look at the post author, so if I say post dot author, then we can see that it returns that user object. And that is actually the entire user object. So you could even access that user objects attributes. So for example, if I wanted this user's email address, then instead of rerunning another query or anything like that, I could simply say post dot author dot email. And we can see that now we get that author's email address. And that's a really nice feature that we're able to get that extra information from that foreign key like that. Um, okay. So now 
let's see how we would get all of the posts that were written by a specific user. So let's say that we wanted to get all of the posts that were written by this user here. Now you might think that we need to fetch the user and then do a query on the post model filtering by posts with that user as the author. And that is definitely one way to do it. But Django also adds a special query set to the user model that allows us to do this a lot more easily. And the naming convention for this query set is the name of the related model, then underscore set. So it would look like this. It would be uh, model name underscore set. So when it comes to our user, the related model is named post. So we can access the post of our user variable uh, simply by saying, so let me uh, say user. So we have this user here with this username. Now, if we wanted to get all of the posts that they have written, then this is user dot post underscore set. So if I run that, then we can see that it returns something that isn't too readable, but we can actually use that post set to run queries on the post that this user has created. So if we wanted to get all of the posts, then we could simply say user dot post underscore set dot all. And if we run that, then we can see that now we have a query set of the uh, two posts that we've just created because this user is the author of both of those posts. So let me clear the screen here and show this one more time. So if we want to get all of the posts that a user has created, we can use the post underscore set and that gives us something that we can run queries against. So if we say post set dot all, then that gives us the two posts that they authored. Now we can actually create a post directly using that post set. So if I wanted to create a third post directly using this user, then I could simply say user dot post underscore set dot create. And then we can create a post. I'll set a title uh, equal to blog three, and we will set the content. Um, and I keep putting that in a string for some reason, then we can set content uh, equal to uh, third post content with an exclamation point. And now I can hit enter and it will create that post. Now notice that we didn't specify an author for that post because Django knows that we wanted to create that post for that user's post set, which means that it automatically makes them the author. And we don't need to run dot save or anything like that either. It automatically saved that to the database. So now if I query all of our posts again, so I'll say uh, post dot objects dot all, then we can see that now we have three blog posts. Okay, so I think that's a pretty good overview of the database queries that we can make. Now, I know that that's a lot to take in. So if you need to go back and rewatch that section a couple of times, then it might take a while for some of that to sink in. Um, so now let me exit out of our shell here. So I will exit. And now let's do two more things before we finish this video. So first, let's use the database queries that we just learned in order to use this real data that we've added to our database instead of the dummy data that we have right now. Uh, and second, let's also see how we can edit this post data within the admin page of our site. So first, let's make some queries in order to grab this data in our database and pass it to our views. So let's open up our blog views where we currently have that dummy data. So within Sublime Text, I'm going to uh, navigate to my blog app and open the blog views. And we can see here that we currently have this dummy data of these posts and we're passing in that uh, dummy data into our context. So instead of using that dummy data, let's instead run a query on our post model and pass in all of that data instead. So first we need to import our post model. So at the top where we're doing our imports, we can say uh, from dot models. Now, since this models is in the same directory, that's why we're using that dot models and we can import post. And again, that dot in front of the models there just means uh, from the models file in the current package, uh, import our post class. So now with when, within our context down here in the home view, Instead of passing in that dummy data, let's instead query all of our posts from the database uh, like we saw in the command line. So we can simply say post dot objects dot all. And as long as those dictionary keys were the same names as our database fields, then 
we shouldn't have to change anything. It should have just worked. Now, if your database fields are different than the keys that you put here in your uh, dummy data dictionary, then you'll have to go into your templates and change those accordingly. Um, but for now, mine were the same. So let's open up our site and see if we're getting the blog post from our database now. So I will go back to our command line and we need to run our development server. So I'll say python manage.py run server. And now let's run the open this in our uh, browser. So we'll run that. So when I reloaded that, you could see that it uh, brought in different posts. So now these are the posts from our database and not the dummy data that we had before. Now it might be hard to notice, but there is one difference here. Um, our dates aren't the same format as they were in our dummy data. And that's because it's using the date time directly from the database without any formatting. So you can see that the date time here says August 28th, 2018, uh, 2.46 AM. So that's kind of a weird formatting for it to have on our page. Uh, so really we would just want this to display the whole month, the day, and then the year. We don't really need the exact time in the display. Uh, you know, unless you were doing something like a Twitter application or something where you expected tons of posts, then it would might be nice to have the exact time there. But I'm going to change this to where it's just the whole month, the day, and then the year. So let's open up our homepage template and see how we can change the formatting of these dates. So I'm going to go back to our application and within our blog app, I'm going to open up templates and then the blog subdirectory and then the home template. Okay, so we have our home template here where we're looping through our post. So now let's find where we're printing out that date posted. So that is right here where we're printing out that posted date. Um, so within our template tags, there are different filters that we can use to change our data around a little bit. So for dates, there is a date filter. So to use this, we can use the vertical bar character and then the filter. So I can put in a vertical bar and then use date as a filter. And then after that date filter, then we can put a colon and inside of a string, we're going to specify how we want to format our date. Now, in order to get the formatting codes for how you specify a certain date, then you're probably gonna to have to look in the documentation. And I'll have this linked in the description section below. Now, I never remember these either, and I always have to look at the docs. So I have this actually pulled up in my browser. So if I go back to my browser here, then I have the Django date documentation pulled up here. So let me make this a little bit larger so that everyone can see. So I think that is good there. So these are the date format characters and what they are equal to. Um, so remember, we want the full month and then the day of the month and then the year. So if I scroll down here a little bit, then we can see the full month over here. Um, so the format character for that is capital F. And then we want the day of the month after that. And if we look up here, then that's actually the first one here, the lowercase d is the day of the month, two digits with leading zeros. And then we'll also want to print out the full year. And if we scroll down a little bit, then we can see a full year here. And the format code for that is a capital Y. And you can use whatever formatting code you want to print out the date in any way that you want. But for this application, I'm gonna use that capital F to do the full month, lowercase d for the day, and then the uppercase Y for the year. So now let's go back to our template and fill in that information. So I will go back to our template here. And with this date filter, I'm gonna specify that we want this as capital F for the full month, and then a space, lowercase d, to specify the day. Then I'm gonna put in a comma to separate the day and the year, and then a space, and then a capital Y. So let's save that. And now with that save, let's look back at our homepage in our browser. So if I pull the browser back up here and reload the homepage, then we can see that now that time is no longer there. It just says August 28th, 2018. Okay, so that's great. So now we can see that those dates are formatted how we want them to be. Um, so now let's go back to our views and delete that post dummy data that we were using in previous videos because now we don't need that anymore and it's taken up a lot of room in our views. So here within our views, we're now using that post.objects.all for our context. So we no longer need this list of dummy data dictionaries there. So now we can save that. 
Okay, so I know that this video is getting a little long, but there is one more thing that I'd like to cover while we're on the topic of database models. So we saw in a previous video how the admin panel allowed us to create, update, and delete different users using a GUI on the admin page. Now we can do that within or with this new post model, but we'll have to do something first. So what I mean by that is if I go to our website right now and go to our admin panel, and let me make this a little bit larger so everyone can see. So within our admin panel, we can still see our groups and our users, but where are the posts? Well, in order to see that model here, we actually have to register that with our admin page. So if we look in our app directory, so let me open back up our page here. If we look in our blog app directory, then we should be able to see an admin.py file. So that is in the same directory as your models.py and your views.py and things like that. So let's open that blog admin.py file and we can see that it says register your models here and we're already importing this admin class. So let's get rid of that. So this is where we can register our models so that they show up on our admin page. So to do that, we first need to import our model. So here at the top, I'll say from dot models import post. And now to register this model with our admin site, we can say admin dot site dot register and pass in that post model and save that. And it's just as easy as that. So now if I reload our admin page and go back to our browser and reload that, now you can see that it just popped up with these post objects. So now within our admin page, we can go inside these posts and we can see that we have blog one, blog two, blog three, and we could you know, create new posts or update these however we want. So within blog one, I could say my first updated content and blog one uh, updated and we could save that here and we could see that we were able to actually update that blog post from within our admin page and we can also change the authors of these blogs so if I was to click on this blog three post then if we scroll down here we can see that the author is set to Corey MS now if I wanted to change this then I could just simply click on that drop down and we can see that test user, which is our other user that we've created, is an option. So if I select him, then I can save that. And now with those changes that we made in the admin site, if we go back to our main page, and let me reset the uh, size of our browser here. If we go back to our main page, then now we can see that our blog uh, one was updated with a new title. And down here at blog three, it's now saying that test user is the author of that blog. So that's awesome. That's extremely powerful that right out of the box with Django, we have the ability to go into the admin page and just change all of our models and all of our objects using that backend admin view. Uh, and it has a nice GUI to where we can go in and change all of that stuff on the fly, all right out of the box. So that is perfect. Okay, so I think that is going to do it for this video. I hope that you got a good sense for how the databases work and how we can create models. Uh, also how we can add data and query data and also get this hooked up to our admin site in order to see and work with it in an easier way within that admin panel. So in the next video, we'll be learning how to create and validate a user registration form so that we can get started with creating some accounts on the front end of our website so that users who don't have access to the admin page can still have that functionality. But if anyone has any questions about what we covered in this video, then feel free to ask in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer those. And if you enjoy these tutorials and would like to support them, then there are several ways you can do that. The easiest way is to simply like the video and give it a thumbs up. And also it's a huge help to share these videos with anyone who you think would find them useful. And if you have the means, you can contribute through Patreon and there's a link to that page in the description section below. Be sure to subscribe for future videos and thank you all for watching.